We are grateful, thankful that we are here this morning in your wonderful presence. In our beautiful house, Father Lord, we worship you, we pray to you. We ask you that you open our hearts, that we can receive what you want to tell us. Open our, our minds so that we can understand what you're trying to tell us. All of us would have different understanding of what you tell us, but the goal is always the same, to do your work. Let us be obedient, Lord, to do, to do your biddings. And to continue to try to walk how you have taught us. Amen. The Lord be with you. And we'll have the opening hymn now. Shall we all rise and give thanks to God? God says, uh, in everything give thanks, for this is the will of God. So let's be thankful for what we have and what we have today and how God has created this beautiful day. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hidden. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name to Christ our Lord. Amen. Collect of the day. God, who was at this time taught the hearts of your faithful people by sending to them the light of your Holy Spirit. Grant us by the same Spirit to have a right judgment in all things. 
and evermore to rejoice in his holy comfort through the merits of Christ Jesus our Saviour, who is alive and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Call to repentance. Let us take this time to talk to God silently in our hearts. Seek good, not evil. Overcome evil, be good. Repent and turn to God. Let us repent of our sins and selfishness and seek God's grace to overcome our shortcomings. General Confession. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, we have sinned against you and against our fellow men in thought, word, and deed. Through negligence, through weakness, through our own deliberate fault, we are truly sorry and repent for all our sins. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, who died for us, forgive us all that is past, and grant that we may serve you in newness of life. To the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, who forgives all who truly repent, have mercy upon you, pardon and deliver you from all your sins, confirm and strengthen you in all goodness and keep you in life eternal through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Shall we rise for the peace? Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. And now may the peace of the Lord be with you all. So offer to one another the sign of peace. Blessed morning, everyone. It's, it has been a very cold morning. Praise the Lord for that beautiful rain that we had. We are here to rejoice, right, and to worship Him. So uh, let's prepare our hearts to uh, worship Him and praise Him, and also that we will await for the spiritual word that He's going to anoint us with. Okay, we are one in the Spirit. We are one of the Lord. Hallelujah.
trust in the Lord no matter what we may go through uh, hardship or problems I mean life is is very uh, realistic yeah. but because we have Christ we obey we believe we have faith in him so this song be a reminder to each and one of us that we trust in our living God and we obey him
Isaiah 40, 31 says, They that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not get weary, walk and not faint. Teach me, Lord, teach me, Lord, to Shall renew the strength. Let this be a prayer to each and every one of us. Shall we sing it one more time that God, we will wait upon you and we'll be renewed by your strength. We will mount up like wings as eagles. We will run and get, not get weary. We will walk and not faint. So teach us, Lord, teach us to wait. They that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not get weary, walk and not faint. Teach me, Lord, teach me, Lord, to Passion wants it. 
session. Uh, for this morning, I won't <coughs> be doing the prayer and intercession. Uh, I'd like to share something of my own. I'm quite sure you all can do the prayer and intercession at home. Pastor has beautifully written this. Uh, recently, I felt like I didn't want to talk to God. Uh, God took something away from me and like a small child, I decided to retaliate. Lah. So I, I told God, I'm not talking to you. Uh, you took something away from me and I was upset. So the funny thing is, every night, this is what I said. So instead of not talking to God, I'm actually talking to God. And then, uh, last week, uh, I realized it was my turn to be up here. So I told God, no, I'm not coming up here this week. I'm not doing this uh, because you took something away from me and I'm, I'm not doing this. Then after a while of thinking, this is a funny thing, I'm still talking to God, is it? And all this, then after a while I thought, uh, it's okay, now I'm a professional. I'll come up here and I'll do this as well because this is for, this is for the church people. This with me and the church, so it's fine. I'll come up here and i do this. And the funny thing was, then God just uh, gave me back what he took from me. It's very funny. It's like, we don't to talk to God, but all the while I'm talking to God. And just now, during the worship, uh, there were some words that I, that I picked up, which was really true. Lah. Trust and obey, for there is no other way. And then, teach me, Lord, teach me, Lord, to wait. Um, I suppose all of us have different uh, life. Um, we come to church all smiley faces, you know, and we thought everyone is fine. But I don't know, maybe some of us are hurting. Uh, but we don't tell, we don't show, right? Because we just want everyone to know that we are fine. But uh, maybe we are not all that fine. If you're fine, hey, it's good. Um, just want to share this thing. Uh, it might or may not uh, be the same for you. Uh, if it's not, um, do pray to God. Do talk to God. God knows that we are sad. God knows that we are angry. But it's all right. Because God knows us, God knows us what is inside here. Uh, he knows we are said he knows luck uh, just that we should always continue to talk to god in however angry in whatever ways lah. he will always listen and the only one that is keeping us away from god is actually us and of course uh, the evil one gracious god grant us the yoke of christ binding us together, tempered by your love, guided by your presence, bringing your kingdom into this world. It is to the glory of your name that we pray. Amen. Prayer for church. God, our gracious Heavenly Father, may you pour your Holy Spirit upon our hearts and bless the mission and ministry of St. Gabriel's this assists us to faithfully and sincerely love one another, care for the poor and helpless, and witness to your saving love to all. Give us grace to be a servant of others, as Jesus was a servant of all. We ask this in Jesus' mighty name. Amen.
shall have the ministry of word. Ruben Lo and Sean Chan. Isaiah chapter 40, verse 27 to 31. Why do you complain, Jacob? Why do you say, Israel? My way is hidden from the Lord. My cause is disregarded by my God. Do you not know? Have you not heard? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He will not grow tired or weary, and his understanding no one can fathom. He gives strength to the weary and increases the power of the weak. Even youths grow tired and weary, and young men stumble and fall. But those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. They will soar on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not be faint. This is the word of the Lord. Second Corinthians chapter 13, verse 11 to 14. Finally, brothers and sisters, rejoice. Strive for full restoration. Encourage one another. Be of one mind. Live in peace. And the God of love and peace will be with you. Greet one another with a holy kiss. All God's people here send their greetings. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. This is the word of the Lord. Let us stand for the reading of the Gospel. The Gospel is taken for the Matthew chapter 28, verses 16 to 20. Glory to Christ, our Saviour. Then the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to you, therefore, Go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. This is the gospel of Christ. Praise Let us pray. Bless us, Lord, as we come together, especially today, Trinity Sunday, even as we begin a new journey in our church calendar to look at the ministry of the church in the understanding of what it means to be a Trinitarian congregation. And we pray, Lord, you bless us and guide us in our thinking and in our doing. In Christ's name we pray. Right, good morning to all of you. Today is a, in the church calendar, is a, a important day because uh, from today onward until you go to almost end of the year, Advent, around there, uh, you're talking about Trinity, right? Trinity 1, 2, and 3, and 4, and goes on. So it's a very long period of church season, and it, the focus is on the ministry of the church. All right, so it's not talking about uh, the life of Christ per se, but it's more of an understanding of the whole church, what it means to be a Trinitarian congregation, and what it means to believe in a God who is not only one, but three. And this concept has caused confusion and also discernment, but also certainly objection from other monotheistic religion. They, you know, they feel that God is one, how come it's three? But we don't, of course, don't believe in three God or anything of that sort. But some of the God is one, but expressed in the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And those are very fundamentals to classical and traditional Christianity. Uh, if you take out any one of it, then you can, of course, still be a Christian. But what happens is that any figure that you take out from the Trinitarian concept, you'll move into what they call heresy or cult. Right. So what we are in need 
<clears throat> so whenever you uh, recite the Nicene Creed, it goes back to very early church where they try to kind of uh, bring the church together. Because there's so many things being said about this person Christ. Hmm? And so they come up with the Nicene Creed in order to uh, familiarize and to conceptualize and to finalize the understanding of God. But today we're not going to go into all those uh, very difficult areas of how to explain it. But rather we already accept it as something that uh, we will not debate on it, but rather how do we live out the Trinitarian concept as a congregation? Okay? And uh, this is important so that you hold the Christian community and the whole Christian faith together. So being a Trinitarian congregation. So what does it mean? If you believe in the Trinity and a Trinitarian congregation is one that sees itself so you see yourself as a community that is called and sent by the Holy Spirit to bear witness to the good news of Jesus Christ in word, but also in your deeds. Why? Because you do it for the sake of the world, for, for the reconciliation of the world that God has created and God loves so much. Remember John 3.16, you know the passage very well, for God so loved the world. So for the sake of that understanding, we are called to witness to that good news. So we believe that God, the Holy Spirit, makes it possible for us to recognize and to believe the good news of Jesus, of Jesus as Son of God that brings salvation in the world. So that belief that we have is not something of our own, but it's only the Holy Spirit that convinces our heart that that is true. Because without that, then it's impossible to believe how can God die on the cross and rose again three days later, right? It's only the work of the Holy Spirit Otherwise, you'll be just like Judaism or uh, another religion that believe only one God and nothing beyond that. Now, why should you believe in three? That's because the Holy Spirit has convicted in your heart that that is something more to that. And Jesus came to the world in order to bring that good news of God in a very, very personal way. All right? So in order to reveal the loving heart, the loving mission of God the Father, so a Trinitarian congregation, in essence, is one that sees itself calling into mission by the Trinitarian God that we confessed. And if you look at the God the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, it is a unity and it's in mission, right? It brings the mission of God's work in the world in different areas and different time of history. God the Father came, created the world, and God the Son came in order to bring salvation and finally God the Holy Spirit they came to inspire the whole understanding that you can understanding and accept that. It is not distinct, separate, all in one, but different area in which you will be able to understand that. That's how we see ourselves as a Trinitarian congregation and we confess that. So God right from the beginning is a missionary God. God came into the world in order to bring the world back to God, right? Sin can only be abolished, none other by the one who created the world and nobody else. Neither the angels nor any other being can do that. Only God can do that. So God in different stages of history, different stages of life have brought that message to the world. So being a Trinitarian congregation means it's a congregation in mission. And rightly stated in the prayer for St. Gabriel, he says uh, that the Holy Spirit coming upon our heart will bless the mission and ministry of St. Gabriel's. Okay? So the mission and ministry of St. Gabriel's is exactly that. It's fashion upon the Trinitarian, Trinitarian concept. Um, so there are a few things in which characterize this congregation in mission. So every church... So every society is characterized by certain qualities. You can know them. If you look at them, you know who they are. Even, you know, if you are Chinese, if you are Cantonese, you know, certain characteristics, you still are Cantonese. Or you are Hokkien, or Hakka, or you are Hainanese. Or if you are Chinese, you know, certain cultural things you do. Or if you are Indian, certain things that you do. Or you are Malay, certain things that you do. Right? If you are Muslim, certain things that characterize you, the way you dress, the way you uh, exercise yourself. Uh, if you are so on and so forth, there's certain characteristic. So basically, there are three things I want to share with you, basic three things that characterize, characterizes 
a Trinitarian congregation. Of course, there will be many other more, uh, but all these must be related, right? It cannot divert from there. And firstly, um, a congregation in mission, or rather the Trinitarian congregation, is first of all connected in worship, especially in corporate, corporate worship, right? So every week we come together to make our confession. Every week we encourage people to be here in a corporate manner. Of course, some people would like to do it at home or just go online. Uh, those are one way to do it and probably it's a necessity during COVID time or it's a necessity when there's persecution where corporate worship, community worship is not allowed. Like certain society, they persecute the early church at least. Huh? They are not allowed to worship and your worship, you're being persecuted. So people gravitate towards home cell group and being there. Uh, the early church and certain areas in communist countries, socialist country, uh, where public worship is not allowed. Uh, even it happens today, so they keep it to themselves and it happens in that way. But by and large, corporate worship has always been the characteristic of a congregation in mission. And we come out in order to confess our faith in the Nicene Creed, the Apostles' Creed, uh, Athanasian Creed, whatever creed you have, uh, that is come corporately, we affirm that this is what we believe in. And every creed that you confess it's always very intentional. Uh, it is always purposeful. You can understand it. And it's knowledgeable, reasonable, and theologically balanced. Right? Uh, it must be expressed in the language that you and I can express together. Whether it's in Chinese, Tamil, uh, Bahasa Malaysia, or English. It's something that we all know and we all share together. And it's done consciously. And between that uh, Nicene Creed or whatever creed it is, is the fullness of the theology that I understand that tells us. So our Nicene Creed always have these three elements of Father, uh, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. We oh, divided that, no? So that that was sustain us in our journey so we, we don't get far away from it. It's sustainable and it's transmittable, right? So whether it's uh, 1,000 years ago, 500 years ago, Today, 500 years later, or if Jesus only come back 1,000 years later, it is still transmittable. It doesn't change. It will remain as it is when it's first formulated until the day when Christ come back. All right? And that will what, that's what we all confess in. And it's important to hold the Christian congregation together everywhere you go in the world. It must not deviate from there. Right? No matter where you are, whether you're in Europe, America, Asia, Africa, anywhere, the confession that you make must always be one and the same. Um, so, in Anglican Church, we have the 39 Articles of Faith. Those are part of the confession too, um, that kind of explain, that expound and uh, extrapolate and um, expanded the idea of this uh, Nicene Creed. So it talks about God not only created earth and all that is not existed. It talks about God that created the whole world, but God also knows us and a God who also cares for us. And that's very important, right? To know also means to care, right? A God who knows us, but a God who also cares for you and a God who loves you and wants to use us to care for the world. And clearly, that is what marked the first important uh, criteria of a congregation, Trinitarian con uh, congregation. That it must, first of all, must be a worshipping community. So every Sunday is very important, right, to gather here. And anybody of you, if you are following online, online, and you have not been in church for a long time, I think you should get back, okay? Online, Worship, uh, individual worship cannot be a substitute for corporate worship. It's not how it functions. You should get back. If you're listening, if a church member is listening, following, please do come back for corporate worship. You know, when you are not in corporate worship, you sit down, you're having your tea, coffee, you've been moving here, moving there. Hardly anyone can really follow online service. I do that. I find I'm distracted, you know, when online service. Uh, 
Because he's, nobody can control you, right? Right now you sit down, I can see you, then you want to go out also, you're a bit reluctant. People will see you. Uh, uh, yes. But when you're at home on your own, you know that discipline is very lacking unless you're very, very disciplined, which many people are not. Corporate worship is essential. You need to get back online and to be, uh, not online, to get back on site and be together, be connected. That is a Trinitarian congregation in mission because worship is your first step in mission. Any congregation want to do mission, the first thing they need to do must always be worship. Be because before any mission start, worship is first of all there. If you look at the, what the Father, Son and Holy Spirit, the first thing that Jesus ever did before he go out to preach and do anything else, he was in communion with God the Father, remember? That is what you need to do, a congregation need to do uh, before anything can happen. So worship is the first criteria of a Trinitarian congregation. And secondly, uh, a Trinitarian congregation is connected in faith, right? Uh, we do not live on the mountaintop. For example, you look at the Great Commission when it's given, they want on the mountaintop. But after that, they're primarily asked to come down on earth to the valley. And here, I think we must not always wait for worship to be on the mountaintop experience. That is one part of it to inspire us. But ultimately, the connection, the real connection is when we are down on earth, right? Connected to God, to each other, and inspire one another to believe afresh and anew, right? The church at its best, yes, we worship, but it also prepares us for the life in the world. And Matthew said his accounts of Jesus gathering the disciples on the mountaintop to testify. And that is what the gospel story tried to tell us, huh? that the encounter with God when they saw Jesus, when they see the revelation of God, the theophany, they call it, huh? God revealed himself in a way that we can understand. And it brings us to the understanding that Jesus, Moses met God on Mount Sinai, right? The bush, fire on bush, and then he saw the cloud and God was there with us, uh, with him. And ultimately, end of the day, he must come down to the people where the real mission begins, right? So the disciples did not stay on top there any longer than Moses did. Neither was in the transfiguration when they saw it, um, ultimately, they have to come down and then Jesus sent them into the world and the Great Commission and commissioned them to go out and to preach the gospel and to baptize them in the Father, in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. So we come to church to be inspired by their faith, to carry out God's faith with other people, involve living our faith with our neighbors, our classmates, our friends, our employers, employees, and many more. Right? We are called to be faithful to exercise their faith in whatever variety of roles that we are in. And we are called by Jesus to respond to those needs. And if you look at the more traditional church, they would have this procession. Eh? Uh, it's not just look nice, eh? you know. <laughs> if you look at the coronation of King Charles, they have this uh, marching in, coming in, right? Uh, of course, at the time, the choir doesn't march because uh, it's a different occasion. But ultimately, if you look at normal service, they would process in. And end of the service, they would process out. They say that from the world, we come into the house of God, where we're inspired, where we're fed. And then we pr proceed out again. That's why at the end of the service, we always say, go, right, to love and serve the Lord. Remember the marching order? Huh? Go to love, uh, to love and serve the Lord in the name of Christ. And it tells us that uh, worship and faith is something corporate. So collective confession of faith, our collective confession of faith, and the communal expression of faith, and the corporate gathering of faith. You get what I mean? So the confession, the collective confession of faith, the Nicene Creed, the communal expression of faith uh, that we do in our worship, even coming out to receive the communion in a corporate manner. Uh, therefore, we don't do Holy Communion on a personal level. Of course, if you're sick in the hospital, you do it personally. Eh? Uh, beyond that, we don't go to houses to houses just to administer communion. We always try to, as pastor, I tell you that, we try to avoid that, right? Uh, you know, to make a special 
exception for people who doesn't want to come to church, but they want to be administered in a private, maybe not in Malaysia, uh, a certain part of uh, maybe Europe, they have this very special connection, personal chaplain, they call them. Uh, uh, they don't come to church, but they, the minister will go there and give them the communion in a special way. And probably if you have a royal family, they have a royal chapel, they have a personal chaplain, uh, because for them to go to a public place for worship is a security problem. Uh, because the whole place will be locked out the night before and even after that. So they have their private chapel and uh, have the private chaplain to give them Holy Communion. But by and large, uh, we do not do that because there's something called collective confession of faith and there's something called communal expression of faith and something called corporate gathering of faith to tell us that the Trinitarian concept of God and the congregation is larger, stronger and represent bigger than our personal faith, all right? Because uh, all of us, we have personal uh, issues. Uh, as Daniel has rightly expressed, yeah, those are personal issues and those are very important issues. But we must always remember that the collective presence of everybody is bigger than our own individual things, our individual issues. Tell us, go, look beyond and go beyond. And therefore, we gather here all right? We gather here in order to tell us that life is more than just me alone. But looking beyond, then we find the strength to journey. All right? As one saying goes, if you want to walk fast, go f- walk fast, walk alone. If you want to walk far, walk with someone else. If you want to walk forever, then walk with God. Lah. Huh? So it's always good to walk together. That's where we find our strength. Now, having said these two things, worship and faith, but there's something also very important in which you also need to recognize. And don't forget that uh, among our midst, there'll be different people, different level of journey. Now, if you look at the passage right to us in the gospel, it, talks, it, t- it tells us some doubted, right? So don't forget about those who are not really in our midst. Uh, Many people come, and some will not journey anymore. We will stay outside. And don't forget about this doubt or backslider, those who are not part of us in a very uh, standard way, right? Uh, those who, you look at the life of the disciples, uh, those who follow him from the start, and they know him best, and they know him personally. But not all of them believe in the story of the resurrection, although they are there. Even when they see Jesus, you find that they find it hard to believe. And that's why the gospel story tells us that they put it in a very realistic way. Some doubt it, huh? they don't believe. It's, but, but rather, you know, the gospel it must tell us something very important about we, who we are and some of the people who journey. And Matthew reports that even now at the close of the story, and just as the disciples are about to be commissioned as Jesus' witnesses, they somehow rather find it hard to believe in Jesus even as they worship Him. And that is who we are, people made up of a mixture of faith and doubt, hope and fear, success and failure. Good doubt and the continuous searching is part and parcel of our life in our faith community. And it's always helpful to welcome people wherever they are in their faith journey. It is difficult to believe at times. We can recall that we can be lonely at times, feeling the same way and we feel ultimately guilty. Ah, is my faith genuine? Uh, Do I really sincerely believe? Well, have no fear because God will always take the first responsibility of keeping His promise, although we does not keep our promise or fail to do so. But God is always faithful to us. Now, this is a very important concept. I'll tell you from my life uh, as a pastor, um, it'd be nice if everybody in the electoral roll, right, everybody comes, uh, if you get 50%, 60%, 70%, I think you'll be quite happy. Everybody contribute. That would be great. But it never happened anywhere, any church. uh, There'll always be quite a number who are there but not there, (laughs) right? Uh, So it's easy to kind of, uh, you know, 
pray for them, it's okay to pray for them, but ultimately what would you do? Will you accept them? Sometimes you don't even know who they are. Uh, from my pastoral experience, always a struggle. Uh, not here yet, but in the bigger church, suddenly the undertaker will call me, you know. So one guy is in my church, he's undertaker. And sometimes, some elsewhere, they call, are you Anglican pastor? I say, yes. Uh, you know, this person passed away, you know, and he doesn't go to any church, but he say he go to Anglican church before. Uh, he's Anglican members before and this and that. What, what do you do? Bury him or not? He says he's Anglican member, but which church he says is uh, this particular church, right? But a long time he's not been there. Uh, I don't want to call the other pastor like, whether they know. Maybe the pastor don't even know who they are, right? But actually, we give them the benefit of the doubts. Now. Whether they are, as long as they're not Muslim, all right? As long as they're not Muslim, their family say they want to be buried in the Christian right, we just do it. Lah. Yeah? Because some people just along the way, just not there. Are we going to deny them the last right? right? Because uh, I always do it. Lah. I've never denied anybody who, uh, even I do not know them. If they say they're Christian, and nobody bury them, I just do it. All right? Because some or other, you don't realize that Many people just along the way just fade out. Huh? Now, the big question is, after you're doing all that, nah, do they actually come back to church? Do they suddenly feel a sense that, wow, the church accepted me, you know, like this and that. But I did it on a personal level and sometimes like church member would just come along. But the reality is, actually, I've not seen any of them coming back to church. Huh? Uh, the family member, the family members, are maybe they are, they are, not, they are non-Christian. Okay? Uh, and even those who are from mixed religious background, all right, and the son passed away, died, and because the mother is a Hindu, so they have always Hindu right, but the father is a Christian. I happen to know them, and the father just requested that go and say a Christian prayer. La. Although he's not baptized, he's not anything, he's not a Christian in any way. For the father, you see, I still feel so much better if at least a Christian prayer is being said. Right, Christian priest is there, so I just do it, right, for the sake of the family. And who knows hmm, the way that we express the love of God to them. So remember that doubt is very much part of the journey of faith, and there are many people who are not part and parcel right now with us. But we need to accept them, pray for them, but don't treat them as something that you know something is very wrong with them. We encourage them, but remember they are a child of God as well. But wherever it is, we need to extend to them. Right? And the gospel story tells us in a very realistic way that among all the disciples, the struggle will always be there. Even we ourselves sometimes can backslide. But remember one important thing. No matter how backslided we are, no matter how backward we are, no matter how far we have strayed away, God's promise is always there and God is always faithful. Just like the prodigal son. Remember the father? The son drifted away, but the father has never lost love. And that is the message we need to bring to the world. No matter where, who, where you are, who you are, how far away you are from God, God's promise holds true and is always available to you. So, a Christian community, a Trinitarian congregation is a mission, missionary congregation, is connected in worship, connected in faith. And finally, a Trinitarian congregation is connected in hope, right? A congregation in mission always finds the authority hope consolation and comfort in the commission of Jesus and the promise of his presence. Remember Jesus said, I will be with you to the end of the ages. We share what we have seen. We share what we have heard because Jesus wants all the people to know the mercy of God and so commission his disciples to be that witnesses. Right? We are commissioned by God through Jesus to bear witness to the commission that God's mercy is with us. The goal and the objective is that as many of God's people as possible will hear that, that how much God loves them and values them. Because so much of life tells us and makes us doubtful that we are actually important or that God actually loves us and values us much. Right or not? Society always gives us very ideal beautiful things that very few can actually achieve. Uh, today you can, uh, you, in your phone, you can do filter, right? Makes you look so more beautiful than where you actually are. 
They can do that, no? So be careful, we have all this online relationship, no? So beautiful, like this person, where you fall in love with, no? But end of the day, you realize it's not really that. You can make yourself so beautiful. I think technology is wonderful, no? The way they kind of make it all, uh, you look at it, wow, and then you fall in love with yourself, huh? Uh, because why? The world tells us we are not really so beautiful. So make yourself beautiful uh, electronically. Uh, value yourself in a way that beyond what you can. But no. And when you come back to reality, you realize that things are not so rosy and so wonderful. And so it's so important for us to not depend on this artificial mean and superficial means to make us uh, feel good. It's only the love of God. Right, and tells us that those cultural and personal things that we have, God actually doesn't place much important. It's the value of us as a person, our spiritual value. And that is why Jesus promised us to be with us, to hold unto us and to continue with us and to strive to bear witness to God's love. Right? God promised to be with us, to walk with us, no matter how ugly you think you are, no matter how worthless you think you are, no matter how of not value you are, God promised to be with us. And that is something very, uh, something very meaningful because we realize that if you're not good enough, you're not rich enough, wealthy enough, talented enough, no, nobody really want to walk close with you. Right? We, we, we want nice people, rich people, right? beautiful people, talented people. If you don't have all that, nobody actually want to hang around with you. But God hangs around with us and God knows. And the gospel writer tells us, even if you have doubt, if you're not good enough, God will still be with you. So, he invites us to come, all right? And we also promised the presence of Jesus and through the Holy Spirit, the ongoing love and support, no matter what may come, right? We find our hope, our consolation in that promise. So, Isaiah 40, 31 that we read just now, those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. That's what it says. Those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. They will soar on wings like eagle. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not be faint-hearted. Right? And you can only feel that if you feel that you're useful, you are being loved. You can't soar, you can't walk upright. You can't walk with confidence if you feel that you're useless. Right? It's only when you feel that you're valued by someone, then you walk with confidence. And the Bible tells us that we can all walk with confidence whether you are walking all the time or you have stopped halfway or you even walk backward. Remember that the promise of God still holds true. That if you walk again with God, your strength will be renewed. And so for all congregation, we are called to bear the witness of this mercy and love of God and Trinity, Trinity Sunday tells us the ministry of the church later on is what will guide us, right, to be a fruitful community. And 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 11 tells us, and finally, brothers, aim for perfection. And it's an interesting word, aim for perfection. Uh, in a sense, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit has a perfect relationship, right? So we are called to have Perfect, not in the sense of without any mistake, not like the Godhead, but rather in harmony, right? Aim for perfection, aim for harmony, and listen to my appeal. Be of one mind, live in peace, and the God of love and peace will be with you, all right? And so if you go back and read the Bible, there's a lot of practical things that you can do in order to make that reality come into uh, fruition, but just remember that three things that a three different con congregation always hold true. First, it must be a congregation connected in worship, a congregation connected in faith, and a congregation connected in hope. And you can expand this many, many times more. But these are the basic things in which I think the church is called to be and Jesus tells us to be the disciples that will bring the good news to the world. And let us pray that uh, God will be with us and then to continue to walk and to understand how we can be that disciples.
So we shall pray and we shall uh, look, pray through these uh, little articles here that I printed. And may this be something as a reminder for us what it means to be in the midst of God eternal, three in one. Let us pray. In the name of the Father, with us from our beginnings, you so loved the world that you gave us your Son. And of the Son who came to live among us, your everlasting gift of yourself. And of the Holy Spirit, always with us now, between our hearts, inspiring our soul. Amen. Thank you, Pastor, for the inspiring, encouraging, and reminder message again. Where is the camera that is for the online one? This one? This one? Okay. Uh, uh, hi, church members in, at home, sitting comfortably in your sofa. Uh, please come back and sit back on our uncomfortable pews. So there's many places here with your names on it. Okay, do come back. Please stand for the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, Light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, or one being with the Father, through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became truly human. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate, he suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again, in accordance with the scriptures, he ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy, Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins, we look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Please be seated. Now for offer tree. prayer. Yours, Lord, is the greatness, the power, the glory, the splendor, and the majesty. For everything in heaven and on earth is yours. All things come from you. 
and by your own do we give you holy communion The Lord is here. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. Beloved, the scripture tells us that our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night he was betrayed, took bread and gave you thanks. He broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way after supper, he took the cup and gave you thanks. He gave it to them saying, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Christ has died, Christ has risen, Christ will come again. Let us pray the Lord's Prayer together. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, it will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptations, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. The prayer of humble access. We do not presume to come to your table, O merciful Lord, trusting your own righteousness, but your manifold and great mercies. We are not worthy so much as to gather the crumbs under your table. But you are the same Lord, whose nature is always to have mercy. Grant us, therefore, gracious Lord, so to eat the flesh of your dear Son, Jesus Christ, and to drink his blood, that we may ever more dwell in him and he in us. Amen. Break this bread to share in the body of Christ. Because we all share in one bread. Draw near with faith, receive the body of our Lord Jesus Christ, which he gave for you, and his blood which he shed for you. Eat and drink in remembrance that Christ suffered and died for you, and feed on him in your hearts by faith with thanksgiving. Prayer of thanksgiving, let us give thanks together. Let us pray. Almighty God, we thank you for feeding us with the body and blood of the Son, Jesus Christ. Through him, offer you our souls and bodies to be a living sacrifice. Send us out in the power of the Spirit to live and work your praise and glory. Amen. We shall now have the notices. We have a guest today, uh, Shelley and Shame Onkili from Perth, Australia. Uh, do join us afterward at the coffee's corner. Uh, the notices. 
Uh, last, uh, next week, we'll have Parents' Day. Do join us. Uh, do everyone from at home come? Remember, plenty of seats. The rest of the notices, you all can see by yourself. Uh, this week, we have a few people for the birthdays. Let's give them a short prayer. For the Lord, please bless these few individuals. Bless that they have a wonderful week. Bless that they will continue to praise you, and they will continue to be blessed. In your name, Amen. Uh, the bulletin, I hope you all take it back, at least the uh, announcement part uh, for the week. Just pin it onto the fridge. Sometimes information there, you may need it. Huh? Um, we try to update as much as we can. And some of the prayers you may find useful, and so please do use it in your devotion during the week. Uh, next week, we're having special Parents' Day. Uh, we have lined up something after the service. Uh, if you have been longing, waiting to sing a song or something like that, you know. Uh, so we are having a little area where you can do that. And then in conjunction with that, our building plan has been approved by the diocese, which means that the architect and our committee can work uh, confidently. <laughs> right, so, and after that, we will submit it to DBKL. There shouldn't be any problem. It will take some time, but I think the official process is already there. So we have the confidence that to proceed accordingly. And so next week, uh, we are not just going to do a little bit of uh, singing and some, 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 uh, some fun area there during the Makan time, uh, but also start collecting building fun. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> so bring your wallet, uh, top it out as much as you can, like you top your touch and go. <laughs> okay, this is just a way for us to gather together and, and to do something. All right? So bring your family, friends, if you want. Uh, invite them for a makan here. Uh, there's one way for us to share with them. Huh? All right, now we shall all rise to say the closing prayer, and then we shall sing the doxology. Let us pray. Blessed are you, O Lord, praiseworthy and exalted over all ages, and blessed is your holy and glorious name. Blessed are you and glorious above all forever. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here. Peace to love and serve the Lord. Amen.